Um, my name is Carlos Alfaro. I am an executive board member for Students for Liberty. Uh, it's a 501c3 nonprofit uh, with students, all run by students and for students. We have groups all over the world, and we do something like this. <laughs> uh, I joined LLI recently here, uh, a part of the leadership team and planning conferences all over the world uh, with them and using our resources from Students for Liberty. Um, now we're implementing Young Americans for Liberty into our ASU coalition. Uh, as well as the college Republicans. Uh, our goal is to uh, come together and have different parts, of course, of being an, uh, active in uh, politics, being active in philosophy and in discussions and in bringing speakers, just like the event you're here you're sitting at, um, and spread our ideas that way in different, and attack it in different scenarios. So um, we want to make this very conversational. Like I said, uh, feel free to write your questions down, get a drink during the, the, spe the, the speaker. Um, we want to bring our camps and our program to Phoenix for the first time. This is the, the first experience that LLI has uh, here in the U.S., or at least in Arizona. So we want it to be more of a camp uh, feel, right? Like we were out in the woods and we're talking about economics. What, what better thing is there? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're, all, we, all we're missing is the bonfire. So we have plenty to drink, uh, a, f a couple of finger foods over there, so feel free to do that. Uh, par part of our leadership here is Glenn Kripe, uh, who will be speaking to you right n next. Uh, uh, Robin Corner also is on the L LLI team, and uh, you'll see him. He's running around putting out fires for all this. Uh, his name is Rob, Rob Kramer. He also just recently joined our team uh, to promote these ideas and to plan these events. So uh, please come talk to us about what we're doing. We're really excited to be here uh, and to bring you this program. Uh, so here's Glenn. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's really good to see you here at the Liberty Cabaret Nightclub. Uh, uh, sorry, at the Goldwater Institute. <laughs> Uh, so I'll just say a few minutes about Language of Liberty Institute, uh, what we do and why, and our, our purpose is to spread freedom. Uh, LLI is a, a nonprofit corporation registered here in Arizona. I registered it here because I live here. I've lived in Phoenix for eight years. I'm originally from Chicago and have lived in many places, but now I'm an, an old-time Arizonan, eight years, right? But not as much as some of you, I know. Uh, what... Um, in 2005, I uh, registered the LLI with uh, a couple of partners, and our main project, our main activity, is what we call Liberty English Camps, or sometimes simply Liberty Camps. And what that is typically is a five-day and night uh, program where we, in, in foreign countries, in developing countries, and as you can probably guess, you're looking at some of the evidence here behind me. We go out into a, a retreat kind of setting, like a ski, a ski resort or the beach. Or uh, We don't sleep in tents. We haven't done that yet. Uh, I think Carlos wants to do that one of these days soon. But, uh, but we, we're, we're in cabins or a ski resort or something. And we have 30 to 40 uh, young people, college age. Who, local, local people, local young people uh, who speak some English but are usually not fluent. So they're not beginners, and they're, but they're not fluent. And they're, they're coming to, because we, uh, we offer a combination of three things. So one is the English conversation practice with native speakers. The second is exploration of classical liberal ideas. And I always say classical liberal, not libertarian, because in this country, libertarian uh, means a lot of strange things to a lot of strange people. And overseas, most people never heard the word, so it doesn't make any sense. So I say classical liberal, and I'm sure you know what that means. Limited government, low taxes, individual rights, free trade. We, so we practice English conversation, but we don't just talk about the weather. We talk about important things. We talk about ideas, and we talk about how to apply them in real life, such as starting a business. Uh, we, in these camps, we offer um, a, a lot of uh, uh, conversation practice in small groups. We organize debates. We have workshops. We have presentations. We, do, we have a lot of tricks to get the, the students to, to practice and, and to, to speak English. Uh, they, some of them have read many of the books that probably many of you have read. Uh, the Austrian Economics, uh, Ayn Rand, uh, other libertarian thinkers. 
Uh, some of them have not. Some, for some of them, it's, it, these ideas are fairly new. Even the ones who have, have uh, heard or read of the ideas have usually not done that in English. So the camp is in a good experience. It has something to offer uh, everybody. Uh, Robin is one of my dear friends, a longtime friend and colleagues. Uh, Robin has, been, uh, has, a, has uh, joined us at several of our camps. Uh, Carlos, I have not known as long. Uh, Carlos this year has, uh, has become much more involved. And the three of us had an uh, amazing experience this past month in April. We spent 12 days in Brazil. We went to three cities, uh, sorry, we went to two cities and we had three events and we met over 100 people, 100 young people discussing libertarian ideas in, in English. So besides being an incredibly beautiful country, <laughs> Brazil is full of beautiful people, including a lot of young and future libertarians. So we hope to return often and, and soon. Uh, there are a couple of our other friends here who have joined us at, at our camps, uh, like Tom and Michael. So they may have, have some interesting stories to tell you about this. So anyway, what are we doing here this weekend? What are we doing tonight? Uh, you know, over the years, as I've talked to Americans about the project, I've explained what we're doing, and they say, wow, Glenn, that's really cool. But why don't you stay home? Why don't you do that here? You know, we, we need this kind of thing here in America. And I'm going, well, yeah, OK. Well, well you don't need English practice in America. You know, you, uh, and there are lots of libertarian conferences, so, so you know, I don't know. But our goal, all of our goal, is to spread freedom. So any opportunity we have, anywhere, anytime, any place, for five days or two days or two hours with wine and campfires or without, we try to find ways to spread freedom. So this is our first time uh, here in Phoenix, here in Arizona, back home. <laughs> our, our program is here. But uh, you don't have to stay five days, and you don't have to sleep in a tent. Uh, I hope that, um, that many of you or all of you will, will come tomorrow for at least part of the day, because we have a lot of exciting speakers and topics. Uh, two of our speakers you will hear uh, tonight. They'll give you kind of an introduction, and then tomorrow they will uh, build more on, on their remarks tonight. And that's Robin and Joe Cobb. So. I hope you will enjoy the program, and I hope you will enjoy the wine and the beer and the coffee. Uh, again, thank you for coming. And now I would like to invite Tom Patterson to say a few words to you. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I am Tom Patterson. The um, the chairman of the Goldwater Institute. On behalf of the Goldwater Institute, I want to uh, welcome you all here. Uh, the Goldwater Institute is uh, very happy to be able to provide a, a venue uh, for our friends at the Language of Liberty Institute and Students for Liberty to be able to pre present a program like this. And uh, I think it's going to be something that will be of great profit to all of us. Some of you may know I was in politics for a while, and one of the few things I learned in politics is that people really like it when you don't talk too long. And so I've got just a couple of points to make, but I think I can get through them pretty quickly, and, uh, and we can move on. Uh, the first thing is I just want to talk a little bit about the Goldwater Institute. First, I, I sense that probably most of you know the Goldwater Institute, but for those of you who don't, uh, we're a, a nonprofit organization that's been in existence for 25 years now, and we are in the liberty business. Uh, that's what we do. In fact, um, we don't mind putting out here that these are the things that we, uh, the values that we work for are limited government, individual responsibility, and economic freedom. That's what we are. Uh, that's what we do. And we have basically two different ways that we approach that. Uh, one is that we are an advocacy organization, which is the dr traditional role of think tanks. We produce papers, uh, but we go beyond that. Uh, we actively advocate. Uh, we are consultants uh, to policymakers. We testify in uh, uh, legislative committees. Uh, we uh, 
uh, conduct uh, seminars and public events, uh, book events. Uh, we produce public uh, uh, sector announcements. We really do everything we can think of to advocate for the principles of, of liberty uh, and the specific policies in Arizona that advance those. Uh, the, the second thing we do, and this is much newer for us, just in the last five or six years, uh, we've developed uh, an ability to litigate on behalf of liberty. And again, I know many of you realize this, but we have a very, very good team of lawyers who litigate on behalf of keeping government within its constitutional bounds. And it involves a, a many s different subject areas, including such things as school choice, election law, uh, health care, uh, economic regulation. We've uh, litigated in front of the Supreme Court and we've litigated a lot, but we've come to the point where we don't even have to litigate that much to affect what happens in our state. And what, what we found is that uh, governmental entities often today will kind of figure out the chances that if they're going to risk something that is questionably constitutional, will the Goldwater Institute come after us? In fact, they even call us and, and say, you know, we're thinking of doing this, uh, this and that, and uh, what do you guys think about that? And, um, you know, of course, the bad part is we don't really get all that much credit because we don't win any cases when they do that. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, seriously, the, the point is to advance liberty, to make government officials aware that we're here, and if that they step out of their bounds, they're going to get it. And if we try to write the papers and convince them that we're right, but if they don't listen to us, uh, then we, we sick the bad boys on them, and, <laughs> and that's the way it is. Um, so anyway, um, I, I think it's fair to say in all seriousness that, that our, our uh, litigation team has been very successful. They're, they're very talented. We're fortunate to have the people that we have uh, doing that for us. You're going to hear from a couple of them tomorrow. And uh, I'm just as proud of it as if I had anything to do with it, and I'll tell you that. I, I just want to say a couple of quick words about the nature of liberty, and I don't want to steal a march on Robin or anybody else who's going to talk about this, but I want to tell you just a little bit about my own uh, personal history. As a young man, which was a while ago, uh, I would think, I would have told you that I loved liberty and I loved being an American, but it was not really something that commanded a lot of my energy or interest. It was not something I spent a lot of time on. I think I would have told you that I believed that Americans had liberty because it had been given to us by our forefathers. And that was part of being an American is that we lived in the land of the free and the home of the brave and we didn't have to worry about things like that because that was what being an American was about, is that we had that and we didn't have to worry about it. Sometime around the celebration of our bicentennial, uh, I became aware in somewhat more depth about the fabulous birthright of freedom that our forefathers had granted to us. And I began to understand more deeply that they had created out of almost nothing but their own philosophical convictions the good life for the posterity that followed them. And it was a very uh, conscious thing that they did. And I also realized that even back in the 70s and 80s, I became convicted that it was slipping away from us, not because we didn't believe in liberty anymore, but because we just didn't care about it enough to defend it and to work for it. So I came to realize what, what teachers from Aristotle to Jefferson have have taught us that liberty is very fragile. Uh, we can never take it for granted. It's hard to acquire. It's very, very difficult to accumulate the conditions in one place that result in a culture of liberty. And it's even harder to maintain. There's a reason that most humans throughout history have lived in poverty and oppression. Preserving liberty takes great care and thought. The, the fact is, if we let nature take its course, we will lose our liberties. As Thomas Jefferson said, the, the natural course of things is for government to expand and for liberty to recede. And that's the, 
the problem that we're always working against. That's the gradient that we have to always oppose. So that's what we're here to do. Liberty must be nourished, it must be defended, it must be passed on from generation to generation, and that's what this conference is all about. Passing it on and being, being passed on too for all of us. We're all, we're all teachers, we're all learners, and that's what we're here to do. And I just want to say that, you know, I know for most of you, uh, there were probably more enjoyable things you could have done with your time. You could have done things that were more leisure oriented and more immediately gratifying, but you didn't do that. Uh, you're here, and liberty is worth it. So thank you, and uh, I congratulate you, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Tom. So yes, uh, we're happy to be here together to explore some ideas of freedom and maybe to learn some argument, new arguments and to learn some, some tools so that we can uh, tell other people, we can communicate more effectively, we can uh, learn some new things today, tomorrow, and who knows, uh, every day, I wish. Uh, so now, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Robin Kerner, who has some very interesting remarks for you. Robin. Thank you, Glenn. Does this one work? Does this one work? Okay, so I can give you back that one. One is enough. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming, and uh, Tom, thanks to you for this opportunity. The Goldwater Institute does fantastic work, and... I just want to say thank you for me for everything that, that it does. Um, thank you for coming. Let's see where to start. Let's start in Phoenix because that's where I am. <clears throat> the, uh, the only uh, congressman I've ever met, you probably heard of him, Dr. Paul, and I met him at the uh, Sheraton. Um, you can't hear me? It's not working? Closer? Oh dear. I could just speak louder. How's that? Yeah. And I, uh, I had a book, one of uh, Ron Paul's books. Uh, I asked him to sign as he was exiting a conference. And, uh, and as he signed it, I said, uh, thank you, Dr. Paul. You're one of the reasons I'm here. And he heard my accent. And uh, he said, well, don't they need you in England then? <laughs> and I said, actually, I think it's too late. So, uh, which speaks to why I'm here as a Brit who cares about liberty, um, why I am fighting for it in the United States. Although if we have time at the end of this talk, um, ask me why I might be wrong about what I said to Dr. Paul, because uh, yesterday some very exciting things happened in Britain that, uh, and I would love to be wrong. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I hope I am wrong about that. Americans, I have discovered, have this quaint notion that they had a revolution against the British. And uh, every nation has its founding myth. Um, all nations are guilty of that. I, I'm not so sure it's true. Um, actually, one of the reasons I love being a Brit, fighting for liberty in the US, is I feel kind of very at home. I feel that I come from your past, but also I come from your future, which I will, I will talk about <laughs> towards the end of my few minutes here. Um, did I? Yes, I did. To tell you what I mean, I don't usually use notes, but I wrote down a couple of quotes. When uh, the Americans were revolting against the British, a certain proportion of them were fervent in their principles, in their fight. But about as many back in the motherland were as fervent too, um, as fervent for the same principles. And obviously, as I think you're gonna hear from Joe, and I'm sure many of you already know, um, many of the philosophers and the thinkers and even the politicians and the statesmen that produced a context for the American foundation um, that enabled America to have its revolution and write its constitution were, of course, British. The more I learn about it, the more I'm convinced that you can go back to at least 1014, I mean before the Magna Carta, 
to see how thinkers and statesmen、um, provided the context, did all the philosophical work, so as it were, your founders didn't have to. So much was done, and.、Um, Edmund Burke said about that the year before the Constitution was ratified, when he was talking about the specific problem of taxation without representation. Let us get an American revenue as we have got an American empire. English privileges have made it all that it is. English privileges will make it all that it can be. And you might say, yeah, but he's just one philosopher. What is perhaps more interesting? Was what was said by a very important English Prime Minister, British Prime Minister, William Pitt the Elder, who, in speaking against the Stamp Act in 1776, about、uh, eight years after the, his premiership ended, said, "I rejoice that America has resisted. Three million people so dead to all feelings of liberty." As voluntarily to submit to be slaves would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest of us, and I might say that that sentiment applies now, perhaps as much as it did then, if not more so. When you think about the liberties that we've lost and we're fighting to get back, I would say we're not far off、um, where the American colonists were when they fought for their independence from Britain. And I should say too that the that fight was very much. In the evolution of liberty,、um, as I said, I think you evolved, let's say, from the British,、um, rather than revolted against. Because if you look at the、uh, if you look at the history of Britain and the history of the fight for liberty in Britain, the big steps I think were made in opposition to a tyranny by a ruler or a ruling class, and there was a democratic backlash. And I know that's kind of Unfashionable to say, because as people who care about liberty, we we always rightly point out the importance of knowing that dem democracy is not a panacea, because democracy itself、um, does not protect our individual rights, and of course that is true. But history is very messy. History is very messy, and the context for the、um, this beautiful thing called the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence was really made. By、um, these men, some of whose names you may not know,、um, some of them were churchmen, as I say, some were politicians. You know, some of them were advisers to the king,、um, who fought for the, for what we now fight for, inch by inch. So, for me, by being in America fighting、um, for liberty, I'm engaging in a very British project, and I think that、um, actually, as it were, the best of British was handed off to the Brits. And their descendants, and of course the Germans and their descendants, and the Dutch and their descendants, in this land. But I feel the continuation.、Um, but as I said, I don't feel I only, as it were, come from your past.、Um, I also feel I, I kind of come from your future. I come from the, the social democracy, the welfare state. That you are racing towards <laughs> as fast as you possibly can, but actually, I'm hopeful now. I am hopeful now because if I say the words "monopoly of force" in England, they try and work out what board game I am talking about. <laughs> if you say the word "libertarian" in England, that sounds like something strangely American, and no one really knows what it means.、Um, not undone by all of my earlier remarks, by the way. I mean, I think the the liberties and the ideas that we still fight for, as I say, are very English. And I'm not a historian, but you know, I love it enough、um, to have a clear sense of that. <clears throat>、um, yes, the social democratic future that you're fighting against.、Uh, in Britain now, 10% of children. Think about this: 10% of children in Britain. Live in a household where they have never seen a parent work, ever. One in ten. One in ten. And yet, every week, their parents come home with a check from the state, and they have everything they need, right? And、um, in fact, there was a fight recently in Britain.、Um, it was a big political hot potato to pass a law to limit welfare payments. To the average income of a household, 
Because if you add all the welfare payments together that you can get in Britain, they total for many, many families more than the average income of a British household. Now, it was interesting. Um, Prime Minister Cameron, at his party conference the year before he became Prime Minister, and he only just became Prime Minister, uh, made a, a great speech at the conference, and he pointed out that Mrs. Thatcher had won uh, her election, her first election, fighting against the immorality on a, of a 97% tax rate on the richest Britons. Cameron pointed out that our welfare state imposes a marginal tax rate by virtue of withdrawal of benefits of 97% on those who would work who are currently on welfare. So, as he said, if Thatcher can win on not taxing the richest among us at 97%, um, surely, he said, the Conservatives of Britain could win on not taxing the poorest among us at 97%. This is not, of course, what anybody intended when they set up this welfare state. And depending on when you run it back to, um, you could say that the, wel uh, the welfare state in its current form basically uh, started with the end of the Second World War, but the birth of the welfare state, 1920s, 1923 perhaps, depending on where you want to measure it from. In Britain, although we, <laughs> I think we gave you the Constitution, or we gave us, I'm going to say us now because I'm going to be American in 18 months and I will proudly take the oath. Um, <laughs> thank you, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> although, although, as I say, I, I think it's a very British project, we don't have this sublime little book, that constitution, you know, that's that, that thick. Um, there's America in the fabric of this nation, not only because of the content of that document, because of the, the wonderful way it was written, the way it was expressed, content and presentation. There's something in the blood here, I feel. There's something in the fabric of this nation that if you, if you walk out of these doors to people who aren't really interested in politics, um, there is a sense of... Uh, you know what, let me use a word that the left like. There's a sense of what social justice is, of what economic justice is. And it doesn't mean what the, pro what the progressives have made it mean over the, um, over the last uh, two, three generations. I should say, actually, that reminds me. I read an article today about the um, huge election uh, success of the most libertarian party in the United Kingdom that didn't exist 20 years ago, United Kingdom Independence Party, um, that yesterday one was polling 25% from zero in 20 years, standing on very basic things like, you know, free markets, um, uh, pulling out of the tyranny that is the European Union, um, and so on and so forth, from zero to 25% uh, in, in, in 20 years. This is why I have hope for Britain, and I think my comment to Ron Paul may have been wrong, by the way. But I read an article about that, um, that win, and the author pointed out that Britons have now become sick of, the, of choosing social liberalism over social justice, which I thought was really interesting, because over here social justice is a lefty thing, right? Like economic justice is a lefty thing, but actually, if you just take the words at their meaning, that's right. One thing everybody has is a sense of fair play. It, take, it took three generations for the British, well, no, it didn't. Let's go back to 1923. It took 90 years. What's that? That's four or five generations, depending on how you count it, um, of, of welfare state to realize that it had gone too far, to realize that you have a dangerous situation when 10% of all children do not see the relationship between doing something and getting something, um, that there might be a problem in having government buy cars for people with issues with mobility, which we now do in the United Kingdom. Um, there is now, the, I think the pendulum has gone as far as it can go. It took that long because there was no fight back. And now you would even say, if you speak to people in the bar, you know, you know or in the pub, or in people's homes, um, about these issues, they, they wouldn't be able to convey some of the ideas with the clarity that we convey them because we have uh, this amazing history in the United States, the, the Bill of Rights and, and all of these principles that the Americans, thank God, ran with, you know, and, uh, from 1776. Um, but they're getting it because a, a fair play is being, is being offended. Um, <clears throat> so how did we get there? Uh, we got there 
because what tends to happen is, um, this, of course, I'm sure all of you already know this and sense this, uh, there's a big gap between good, and good intentions and good outcomes. And when I talk to liberals, which is what I usually do, my, my shtick is to discuss the ideas of liberty with those who identify on the left. Um, I, I make this point. I think in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, it's perfectly reasonable to think if you have this big powerful thing called government and you have this big mechanism called law and you want good outcomes, however you define them, social, economic justice, equality, whatever it is that you think is, is good, health, um, that you just legislate them. That's not an unreasonable position. It's a very reasonable position. It's the position that most people like me take by default after we get our public education, right? It just seems sensible, common sense and good. But now we live in different times. Now the data are in. The data are in. So in America, that's really good because there's a substrate. There's a philosophical substrate in the United States, I think, that allow us to say at this time, at a time when people I will call on the soft left and the soft right know that their lef the left-right account, Republican, conservat uh, Democrat, conservative, liberal account of U.S. politics is in a is, is ineffective, it, it doesn't scratch where it itches, as my old philosophy professor used to say. Um, we can say, well, we understand, we understand that you want a fairer society, whatever that means. We all want social justice, we all want more wealth, not less. We all want more opportunity, not less. Have the programs you've been supporting, have the methods you've been supporting, usually large, centralized, statist methods, which is what we've done in some social democracies all around the world. Have they actually delivered even on your liberal principles? And you can point out, as I say, I come from your future. In the, Uni in the United Kingdom, 1976, the poorest half of Britons uh, controlled, owned 12% of the British economy. That number is now 1%. In the United States, the bottom 40% of Americans own 0.3%, 0.3% of the American economy. The richest 1% own more than 100 times that. If we care about liberty, it is not difficult for us to sit down with our liberal friends and say, enough is enough. Um, we have something in common. We think that if this state of affairs has been brought about through lack of justice, through unfair mechanisms, that we, we don't want that, we want to address that. Could it be that the wonderfully um, optimistic uh, programs that you have supported, and you can see the outcome of this in the social democracies of Europe, which is why I'm saying, you know, this is look to the, look to the future uh, over there, if you don't get off this track. Could it be that, let's, stick with the welfare state, that this system, this big status delivery of good, has stabilized a system in which the state enables wealth to be unfairly concentrated by a certain class exploiting a certain monetary system with certain privileges. Could it be, and here's a crucial thing, that we have been treating the symptoms and not the cause? Because if we say, to many Americans who aren't maybe as exercised as philosophically as we are about some of the things that we care about, um, that we have this common ground, that there are, there are problems that we have in our country that have been created and the things that we've done to undo them have, been, have not worked because they have not understood the causes. There, there is no redistribution. There is, not, you, there is no redistribution big enough to undo the natural consequences of uh, the unfairness that's built into our monetary system, for example. Right? What we need to do as people who love liberty is find the common ground with those all over the political spectrum who already they have a sense. They know that the Democrat story and the Republican story are actually more or less the same story. They know that most of it is 90% of agreement because how is it that these two parties who've had the, the levers, only they have had the levers for decades and decades, generations and generations, have put us where we are? 
that's not, that's not a hard case to make. They can see that. So what are the tacit assumptions? What are the things that are unstated when the conservative sits down with the liberal on CNN and bashes something out? Right? It's the things that are, that are unseen, that are below the surface. Um, the unintended consequences. Uh, the thing that you get when you throw medicine at the symptoms without um, understanding, uh, understanding the causes. And I think that... Um, we live, at a, we live at a ripe time. I think if we can in affirm people's intentions, if we can affirm people's in intentions, then we are not saying to those that we need to persuade, you're wrong. Because you can't sell anything that way. No salesman sells anything by saying, you're wrong. You say you're right, you find out what the need is, you find out what the point of contact is, and there are so many now. Um, and actually, you know, in one of my articles recently, I ventured that, let me, let me talk about, uh, let me now get to my hope for Britain. What happened yesterday uh, was that this party took 25% of the vote, as I said, the United Kingdom Independence Party. And to, to Americans in this room who understand the philosophy of liberty, you would go, ah, they're libertarian light. There they don't. But they're, they're as far as it gets towards liberty in the uh, UK uh, political system. Oh, I forgot my thread. Somebody tell me, how was, where was I going? What did I just say? No, it's not, um, oh yeah, thank you, right, I remember now. Thank you. How did they do that? How is it that the liberty movement, well, how, let's, talk, let's compare and contrast UKIP with the Libertarian Party of, and I know I'm, I'm guessing most people in this room are not members of the Libertarian Party, but with the, with the tailwinds that Liberty had with the Ron Paul um, candidacy, with the amazing energy, um, the fact that I think we've already won the 20-something. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful here. That's why I'm in, I'm in America, because we're going to succeed here, right? And I want to be where we can win. Um, <clears throat> but um, UKIP did it by not getting caught up in the orthodoxy of liberty. They realize that the most, important, the most important issue is the issue that everybody who isn't them gets. It's the issue that the majority of the electorate who may not be able to spell libertarian, um, what do they care about that the establishment do not speak to them about? In the UK, that issue is Europe. All the British know that Europe is a soft tyranny which is turning hard. And the British would vote without doubt in a referendum to withdraw from Europe if, if, they, if that was a vote that would be held this week. Every political, the three main political parties in the UK have promised that uh, when they ran for the election, I think last time, and they've all walked back from the promise. Okay? So UKIP comes along and that's their thing. Now, if you actually care enough to get on UKIP's website, you'll see that they like things like free markets. They don't like things like political correctness. They like things like civil rights and leaving people alone. They like the rule of law. But they don't try and convert people to this whole new philosophy that they don't understand, soaked as they are in social democracy that has been on the rise since the moment Maggie Thatcher left, o left office. Right? They're so, they're, they've got to sell something. Politics the politics of identity. All politics are the politics of identity. Someone votes for, U to, for, for UKIP because they, be they agree with them on the European issue, and there's nowhere else they can go to vote for a party that understands this little bit of liberty that they care about. And it may be that the British that have the sense that there's something wrong with this European project, they don't even use the word liberty in talking about it. Again, it just offends their sense of fair play or their sense of decency, or they just know there's something wrong about this imposition of another overarching level of political power. There's a sense that it's a step backwards. But of course, once you realize that you vote, you, you've done something you've never done and you've considered a political point of view, a political party that you've perhaps never considered before, never voted before, and the world doesn't end. Right? Everything is okay if you still don't vote Labour or Conservative or Republican or Democrat. And not only, not only is, the, is everything still okay, the next day, the newspapers are full, as they are in England today, of UKIP. This party that still doesn't have, by the way, a seat in Parliament. 
but it has now, it's polling 25%. And could win, probably will win, it's already second, probably will win the European elections, the British European elections. The British will put into the European Parliament a majority of politicians who want to abolish the European Parliament. That, that's a win, that's a win for liberty. When they come over to UKIP, as I say, it's not because they've learned a whole philosophy that they're not geared to learn about. Well, they can't because, like in the States, they get their news through the mainstream media too, who don't understand that the axis is not left-right. It's tyranny liberty. Media everywhere don't get that. But they realize that these, these other people who are voting the same way, who are thinking the same thing, they're people like them. And they'll say, well, all right, tell me what you think. What's this free market thing? It's got to be by osmosis. People who love liberty, thankfully it's changing. When I first came to the liberty movement, and I'm very new to it, about four years ago, um, all of the libertarians I met were like my friend Glenn. They're all uh, male white computer programmers. And um, the, re the conferences were full of them. Not anymore, even in four years, even in four years now, to go to a Students for Liberty conference in DC and, and see it filled with um, women and men, right, who don't dress like they're, they're from another planet, right? It's great. We're a cultural change, let alone the politics, we're a cultural change. We're normalizing these ideas. It has, this is why the filibuster was so fantastic. Rand Paul's filibuster for the drones uh, thing. How marvelous. I was in Brussels at a Students for Liberty conference, actually. Um, and we were talking about Rand Paul's filibuster there over the lunch table in Belgium. And when I got back to my laptop and, you know, uh, got online, I see the Huffington Post, which is the mainstream media to, for, oh, everybody in my district in Seattle, right? With a picture of Rand Paul and just the headline in red, 13 hours. And the note underneath, also in red, to make sure you'd see it, that only one Democrat supported him. Just like how UKIP are changing the political landscape in the UK by just pushing, taking over the media, by making themselves relevant, by doing what needs to be done, rather than, you know, having arguments between, I mean, I don't know if you guys have done this before, you know, the anarchists are here and the minarchists are here and the libertarians are there and then the conservatives are there, and we're all going to prove each other, we're all going to prove that we're right. Well, no one wants to say, nobody wants to know that they're wrong. That's, we've got to be smarter than that. And the reason, the reason I'm, I'm so positive about what's going on in the States is because I think we are smarter than that. I think there is um, an understanding now in the liberty movement, um, however you define that, um, that the only principles that are worth having are principles that you can turn pragmatically into action, that can be brought to bear on the lives of our countrymen. Um, there is a difference between principles and purism. I definitely believe in principles in politics. In fact, you know, here they are on the wall here. And of course, we have to, uh, we should never lose sight of them, otherwise what we're doing is in vain. Um, but uh, I like to see the academic arguments calm down a little bit. In Washington uh, state, my home state, um, I was speaking a couple of weekends ago to the Libertarian Party annual uh, conference and I was thrilled that they have passed a resolution uh, for Washington State Libertarian Party that they can officially support through resources and endorse non-libertarian candidates uh, who support these principles. There is a rolling back of partisanship all over the place. I think even Republicans and Democrats are starting to loosen up those uh, affiliations because they say they're hungry for an account of politics, of how we got to this mess um, that uh, isn't the old one, that the more we hear it just takes us further into the mess. And then I spoke to the Republican Liberty Caucus the following weekend, and the guy, the executive director of the Libertar Libertarian Party was there to tell them that the Libertarian Party would now be supporting the Republican Liberty candidates, and in private discussions with um, the vice chair of that Republican group, uh, I understand that there is a willingness for reciprocation um, in those districts where they know in Seattle 
Republicans cannot win, but perhaps a libertarian can. Um, great things are happening. I am very excited to be part of it. As I say, I come from your future, I think, just as a warning. Don't go down that road. It is not that. It is not that. Let's not get complacent. Tyranny is not being raised here as fast as it is in Europe, although I think the Europeans um, still have the march on it. It's that because of this constitution, because of this Bill of Rights, because of this history, um, the, the fight back has already begun. The fight back has already begun here. And it's marvelous. I, uh, as I say, you know, I've mentioned the Students for Liberty quite a bit. Uh, the 20 the, the somethings we've won, I think we're already there. You know, the world became industrial on the first day of the Industrial Revolution in one town in England. On that day, everything had changed. At that day, we lived in an industrial world. There was some inevitability about the arrow of time. The world had changed. The, th the thinking was now real. The technology was being built. That's where we are now in the US, and I think it could only happen in the US. And when I go with Glenn to countries like Poland, um, it still matters what the Americans do, you know. The Americans were a foil for the tyranny that they lived under. Um, Mrs. Thatcher, even from my country, the same. Right? It matters what we do here. The superstructure that the Europeans have built, uh, the constitution that they have established, I mean, the, it's, I mean re, uh, don't read it. My God, don't read the European Constitution, but just see the size of it. Um, and uh, selected, selected, um, selected sentences will horrify you if you've read your American Constitution. Uh, the superstructure that's being built there, thank God the British have stayed out with the currency and they may actually come all the way out, um, makes it a lot harder to roll back what's already been done. We've got a start in the US. We really have a start in the US. And as someone who still, without his American citizenship, um, comes from the rest of the world, I say that the work we do here, we do for the world. Because the shining city on the hill metaphor might sound a bit um, kitsch. It definitely does to no most non-Americans. But if we are not that, there will be none. I think that's where we are now. So um, I'm pleased to be in this fight with you. And uh, thank you, as I say, for coming, and I look forward to speaking with you again tomorrow. Appreciate it. We have about 15 minutes for questions. So if you could, come up to the mic there um, and ask anything you'd like to of Robin. Uh, we have a video, and that's why we want to keep it to the mic. So if you have a question, come on up. Comment is good, too. Joy was writing furiously, so I hope this is a, a very difficult question. You know. <laughs> Hi, Tech. Um, first of all, thank you so much because uh, that, that was one of the most um, fantastic talks I've heard in a long time, and I needed it. I, I needed it about Glad now. to help. <laughs> um, we have, we have a lot of family in England, so we get a lot of feedback as well, and it sounds rather dismal. I'm curious as to how you see the, um, I, I was talking with Carlos earlier, I'm involved in several groups, uh, a little bit of Libertarian, Tea Party, Republican. Um, how do you feel, what, what do you feel the Tea Party movement has done uh, to further the Liberty movement? Well, I, I guess the first thing is, to, I guess, to define the Tea Party movement. I mean, I think the, the brand, of the Tea Party brand has now been sullied. Um, it's not a, a very effective brand now. I think um, whether by actual infiltration by neocons, which definitely happened, I saw that at some Tea Party events, or by the media not having the paradigm to be able to understand and describe what that movement was um, in its essence properly, uh, that also contributed to the dilution. I mean, um, you know, if you tell the public consistently that something is something that it isn't, you know, eventually there's no other idea about that something. Uh, and that's, you know, that problem with the paradigm we're, we're, we're always fighting. Um, I, think, I think it's part of this broader trend. I think the Tea Party, Occupy, UKIP, they are all 
they all arise out of a frustration to say, that says that the teams that we have now to join politically um, have all contributed to the mess that we want to undo. So we have to make some kind of team, some kind of identity that stands against that. And, um, you know, and, and I think, so, so I'm, I'm happy to see any kind of anti-establishment agitation. Um, I mean, I think a very good case could be made from an American point of view that, that UKIP doesn't represent a liberty movement uh, in the UK you know, by American standards. Uh, but it, it does in as much as it is a rejection of um, statism in the biggest sense, um, the political class as a controlling class in its biggest sense. Um, it, is a, it is a fidgeting, it is a frustration, it is a let's do anything but this. You know, it's, a, it's a move at least 90 degrees away and that's the important thing. Um, I think the Tea Party is the same, Occupy is the same, uh, as I say, UKIP is the same. Um, certainly the movement that I've become identified with, which is the Blue Republicans, which is, um, I call it a gateway for the liberty curious left. Uh, I wrote an article that um, was called If You Love Peace, Become a Blue Republican Just for a Year on the Huffington Post. So I know I'm writing for liberals. And I, I did what I have been kind of preaching here tonight. I said, you voted for Obama for all the right reasons. You voted for civil rights, you thought. For peace, you thought. And against crony corporatism, you thought. Now let's do a compare and contrast with Mr. Bush. So I went down the list. And um, I said, so why don't you not give up your liberal principles? Why don't you stick to them like you mean them and become a Republican for the one candidate in the presidential race, as it then was, who actually has any kind of track record behind those principles? Uh, and I was pulling off what I call the soft left for Ron Paul. Um, I even wrote kind of articles in a historic context um, that, you know, to point out that it is not unusual for conservative figures to come forward in history and protect liberal values, especially liberal properly understood, right? Um, and again, it's the helping the left, liberals, the soft left, understand where their liberalism comes from. Um, now, who was it we were speaking with yesterday uh, who mentioned the term, um, uh, said he was a classic conservative? Uh, it was when we were having dinner. Was it Jake? And um, ha having, no, it wasn't dinner, was it? It was beer. We were just drinking a lot of beer. Yeah, um, yeah, cl classic conservative. And um, we kind of joked that a classic conservative probably understood is a classical liberal, right? You know, we, we, we can actually, as people in the liberty movement, provide this kind of intellectual service that now people want. You know, two generations ago, you know, all the left knew that their progressive status programs were going to get them where they needed to go. Well, now they know it, that isn't the case. Um, we, can, we can help them understand their own paradigm, which is always more effective than giving, you know, forcing ours on them. Um, so the Tea Party, to come back to your question, um, is a symptom of the fact that the left-right account of politics that we have is failing. And so things are popping up. Um, and uh, they're all good, you know. It's good that the occupiers are out there, even though they may have views about some things that would be positively Marxist to us. Um, th we have so much in common with them, you know, and uh, I, give a, I give a sp gave a speech at the um, at, uh, Boise State University in Idaho, uh, Blue Republicans and the End of Left versus Right. And it, my last slide, I think it is, I have a, like a, an 11-point um, kind of an 11 point plan that I believe libertarians, like, I mean, capital L libertarians and Occupy people, Tea Party people could all sign up to. And as I started going down the list, people were cheering. Now, I was, I was in a room with liberal students and with people who identified conservative libertarian who came to hear me because I'm a liberty guy. And that room was cheering. Um, there is 90% of what's wrong with the nation is what the left and right have agreed upon. They don't talk about because they agree about it. I think they don't even know what they agree about. It's so much. It's just the accepted um, stuff. People know that, that it's the, it's the deep substrate from which the problem comes. And um, so let, you know, let's, let's speak to that. Let's speak to that. Let's speak to that. Mm. Would you 
Do you know, are there any countries in Europe that are not participating in this constitution thing? What, like, what's the state of liberty oh. in, say, in Switzerland, or are there, Thank can you, you talk asking. about that? Yeah, um, Switzerland is arguably the freest country in the world today. Um, arguably. It is not a uh, full member of the EU. Um, the European constitution, get this, I meant to mention this, so thanks for reminding me, was voted down by every country in which it was put to a referendum. They changed 5% of the text, called it the Lisbon Treaty, and passed it anyway. Right? This is the nature of the tyranny in Europe. Um, the Swiss have a, a proud tradition, uh, also, by the way, the most armed uh, nation in the world, I think, um, but uh, to sort of the Second Amendment fans. Um, they have a proud tradition of liberty because they haven't been invaded because there's a, a, a weapon in every house that, the, that both men and women have to learn how to use. Uh, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, always look to the history. The history says, you know, will tell you so much. Um, but in the EU, all the nations, including those not in the Euro, are subject to the provisions of the Lisbon Treaty, um, the constitution by another name. Uh, so it's bad, it's bad, and it's particularly bad because in that treaty there is, they call it the ratchet mechanism. Imagine if, you're, if you give the state a ratchet, right? What is it that the state wants to ratchet? Power. And that is actually in the law in Europe, right? The state wants it, wants, um, power is voted upwards away from the sovereigns, sovereigns in name only, you might argue. It doesn't come back. There's, there's a, a one-way process that's been put in. Uh, the European project is, w w when you try and understand what's going on in Europe economically, you have to understand that all of the economics is secondary to the pet project, the political project of the men in power running this thing. They, it's their baby, it's their baby. And, um, and if you listen, as you can now on YouTube, to many of the speeches in the European Parliament, uh, you will be appalled. You will, I mean, you will, you will be appalled at the purity of the socialism that is half of that, at least, of that Parliament. And it is out of that sensibility that that constitution was written. Um, which is why I certainly believe that the only good thing that can be done um, is, is to pull out, uh, you know, if we can. I mean, obviously, all the while we're in it, we have to try and slow the train down, but I mean the train is, is racing at a very high speed. Uh, so I am, you know, I, I, I am very concerned about Europe. I mean, I thank God that the British are not European. <laughs> right? I mean, Churchill said, Churchill said it, you know, um, we support the European project, but we will never be of it. Right? That, that's the, that is, I mean, you guys are British, that should tell you. I mean, that's what I was saying at the beginning of my talk. You know, when, when I, I feel like I'm, I'm really um, working with something that on this side of the pond was uh, run with and I don't want to say perfected because we can see, you know, my God, if it was perfected, we wouldn't have the work to do that we have to do. Um, but that was uh, something, you know, something wonderful was done with it here. Um, I think that's our natural instinct. I mean, I, 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 think, we're I think the British are an, are an Atlantic uh, power. Um, in England, I would say a, a, an Atlantic race, but I know Americans will tell me that's not what the word race means, but we use it differently in Britain, uh, in British English. Um, so I'd say we're an Atlantic race. Um, so there's an identity, there's an identity crisis uh, maybe going on in, in Britain. Um, and if we are forced to join uh, what is De w what is, has essentially been a Franco-German, a Franco-German project, um, I don't think we will ever be at peace as a nation. It still may happen because of the, 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 the power and the forces that are being brought to bear politically. Uh, there has not yet been a government of a national sovereign state that has stood up, has actually opposed um, European law, that has just stood and refused. Uh, an important European law. Um, they've always, you know, they'll go home and say some right things and then they go and negotiate it and they sign it anyway. Often against the will of the people. I mean, even the French, if you put it to the vote, would probably pull out now. You know, they'd probably pull out of the Euro. Right, the French, right? Um, so, 
Yeah, I mean, the very fact that this continues as it does with this political class uh, against the will of the people in many respects speaks sadly to the answer to your question, I think. But no, no Switzerland. No, Switzerland stands apart from the EU. Switzerland has separate agree has agreements as a sovereign nation with the EU. Um, it is not, uh, I mean, the Swiss franc is not, you know, is not the euro. Um, yeah, and they, I mean, then they have a, a proud tradition uh, of freedom that, that uh, has not been made subject to European law across the board. Yeah. Just, uh, we're going to take about seven minutes to refuel our drinks and kind of stretch a little bit and talk amongst ourselves, and then we're going to have Joe Cobb speak. Uh, we're also going to have time to uh, talk and discuss with some of the speakers tonight after Joe's speech. So stick around for that, refresh your drinks, and uh, come get some books and talk to some students. Thanks.